Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so t- first of all, thanks a lot for doing it. I mean, I was really looking forward to it for for like last two three weeks. Uh, first, I want to share that why why I wanted to do that. So of course, I've grown up in uh, Pakistan with the history of partition, and uh, I read your paper, and uh, I was just fascinated by the detail, and uh, more importantly. Um, how deeply you actually analyzed what happened so even even growing up with all those stories i actually didn't realize that how many subtleties were there and there is very less education regarding this so uh, so that's that's my reason but please um if you want to introduce that uh, how you got into the subject or the research topic please well, first of all, let me say thanks for having me. It's uh, it's nice to be here and nice to be invited. I'm pleased that you've uh, you've enjoyed some of the things that I've done in the past. I came to the history of the Indian Army first of all in uh, in the 19th century uh, as a postgraduate student looking for a topic, and various people uh, suggested various topics, and one that got my attention was the history of the Indian Army. Um, The Indian Army was an institution raised in the main from Indians, uh, from South Asians. And it struck me that, that it was fascinating that an institution on which the British Empire in India rested was an institution made up in, in, in the main by Indians. And I was looking for a way of approaching the history of empire and colonialism in a slightly different way. And the Indian Army seemed to me to provide a way into that history and and, and a way of asking some interesting questions about how empire operated and who made empire possible. I... um, I'm not really a military historian. I don't really see myself as a military historian. I was trained as a cultural and a social historian. Um, But it struck me that there was very little work done on the social and cultural history of the Indian Army at that stage. And one of the things I wanted to do was, was to try and gauge what kinds of histories could be written on the basis of the records left by the the imperial military in South Asia. Um, as ever, the army was uh, very well funded, relatively well funded. The records that the army generated are therefore relatively extensive and it seemed to me that they were underused by historians. So there were lots and lots of records easily accessible here in London and I began as a postgraduate student to, to work with them and, and to look at what they might enable me to do. I mean, this is brilliant because uh, this is exactly... We had a subject uh, called Pak Studies uh, in, in Pakistan where they talk about these uh, partition. And I lost interest. And I think most of my friends and other people I know pretty much uh, loses interest in Pakistan studies because uh, it's a very biased I would say it's very much entrenched in patriotic and nationalistic ideas so whatever Pakistan or our side has done is the right thing and uh, always we are the heroes so it's not a complete or any way in a critical uh, approach so this is fascinating not only for uh, British people to find out that uh, to 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 accompany which actually went there to trade and that's of course how they gained their power to have a military of that size and the subtleties of uh, Indian army um, means Indian people over there to be part of that army which which allowed uh, British to gain power not only in subcontinent actually maybe some parts around it uh, this is fascinating to listen so uh, what do you think about the role of uh, the Indian soldiers um, in that? Well, well, Indian troops, South Asian troops, we should 
probably more accurately say. Uh, South okay. Asian troops played an absolutely vital role in extending uh, British influence in South Asia and maintaining it and in defending it. And ultimately, they, they played a very, very important role in projecting British power within Asia uh, and indeed across the world during the, the, the World Wars of the 20th century. Um, now, I think it's important to say that m most of those men uh, who fought, quote-unquote, for the British in that period, I think, fought not for a sense of, of nation or national pride. They fought for much more ordinary human reasons for pay, um, sometimes for ideas about loyalty and honour, um, but principally, in my view, for pay. And when we try to overlay onto the history of empire, uh, histories of nations, and you've talked already about Pakistan studies, we could equally say uh, the same of India and we could say the same of, of British histories. When we try to overlay national histories to make sense of what was in many ways fundamentally a multinational exercise, I think we lose sight of what was actually happening on the ground. And that's something that, that definitely happens in South Asia, where the history is quite polarised. Uh, but it's something that also happens here in Britain. We really misunderstand what empire was about if we think of it as a European white British enterprise. It depended at all times on the willingness of local uh, people to play along with, to support, to collaborate with uh, the structures of power and authority that, that made the British so-called empire possible. So th there's one word which you um, describe in your paper or and the chapter also, which is is it. And that is a very interesting word, and I, and I would really like to know how, how what is, so what British uh, or the East India Company and the historians whom we um, take our records uh, interpret that word, mm. and what do you think of is it? Because I have grown up with this word, of course, one of my mother languages is Urdu, and this is a very important word. We use it for just respecting your elders, or we also use this term as in something which is honor and pride in a way that it's a feeling rather than just a word. So this is a, this is a very uh, common term, which is, uh, oh, now this situation is become, uh, this is izzat ka sawal hai, which is like, oh, now this is a question, like our honor, pride, identity, and everything is in question. So this is something very deeply entrenched in, in those cultures. So I, I would love to know both the perspective. So I came to look at ideas around is it an honour in uh, trying to explain the peculiar recruiting patterns that uh, we find in the military history of South Asia. So... From the latter part of the 19th century, from the 1860s and 1870s, uh, colonial recruiting operations drew increasingly from a relatively small number of South Asian communities, from those particularly in the north and the northwest of the subcontinent, so particularly in Punjab, for example, also from, from Nepal, uh, the so-called Gurkhas, um, lots of Patans from Pashtuns from um, from the northwest, um, Punjabis, uh, Sikhs, Muslims from Punjab, and these are the so-called martial races. Uh, colonial uh, officers at the time wrote extensively about the peculiar ethnography of Indian peoples arguing in effect that only certain classes of so-called Orientals were fit to bear arms. And this tied in with a whole set of wider ideas about race and ethnography and to some extent uh, also to ideas about caste. And one of the ways in which contemporaries thought about 
these so-called martial races was through this idea of honour or of izzat, uh, an idea that certain communities valued military service and valued um, the sacrifice uh, that went along with military service. And so izzat became, uh, if you like, one of the ways in which imperial recruiting was thought about and it then also became one of the ways in which the army was structured and was organised so soldiers were encouraged and incentivized to play up to this idea and I think what you can see over time is the way in which the idea becomes a part of identity it becomes a way of thinking about and valorising particular kinds of behaviour, particular kinds of sacrifices and sufferings. And it is, I would argue, a cultural idea. Um, it's an idea produced from the interplay of people. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, this is very fascinating. So, do you, so they actually categorise uh, their recruiting of the soldiers as in who would be fit for what job. Do you think they actually, at that time, when the people who are making policy or enforcing these recruitment laws believed that there are somehow, you know, genetically or, or culturally people fit for these roles, or they actually just played up to already uh, existing ideas in the culture? which everyone else in South Asia supported it? Uh, it's a good question. And there's some debate over, uh, over that question. On the one hand, it's possible to see the martial race recruiting strategy, which was really about concentrating recruiting in particular places and amongst particular people. One can see that quite comfortably as a, a strategy of divide and rule. Yeah. So... It concentrates loyalty and advantage amongst particular communities and it excludes other communities from those advantages. And there's certainly an element of that. This is the period after the Mutiny Rebellion of 1857. Yeah. There are real concerns among some colonial officers about the so-called loyalty of their troops. And... There, there is an emotional advantage for colonial officers in seeing their troops as being particularly loyal and brave. Uh, and of course, all armies, to a greater or lesser extent, promote these kinds of uh, narratives about their, their soldiers. Uh, so on the one hand, we can, we can see very possible that this is a, a strategy of divide and rule. And yet, at the same time, it's also important to recognise that, yes, these ideas do draw from already existing forms of cultural identity. They mobilise and they draw on and they accentuate and they valorise some forms of, of martial self-identity. And this is, in fact, true not just in the, in the northwest of the subcontinent, but before 1857 in, in, in the northeast, around Bihar, um, the um, colonial recruiting is concentrated in the main, further east, uh, amongst the so-called Purbayas or, or Easterners, during the first half of the 19th century. So it is always the case that um, the company and then the colonial state have to make do with what they find, and they they have to build on extant, already existing traditions and ideas. But I would argue that it's clear that over time, uh, the company and then the colonial state transforms the way in which people think about themselves, their communities, and ultimately their relationship with with nations. So, so there, there must be researchers um, sent by the government or, or East India Company to study the phenomena around culture or how we can strategize uh, certain um, recruiting. So there is a there's a critique which I see in your work regarding the reports which were um, written at that time. And then, of course, as the time passes on, people dig through papers or and, and instructions given to uh, the government or, or the military readers 
uh, I would like to explore more that critique which you have, particularly on the um, history where it's a very, um, I would say that ignored part of uh, South Indian local soldiers. And w once they were in the army, then what is their role? I mean, I, I haven't read anything. I've lived there. I don't know anything. I mean, I, I, I would share a few stories, but nothing more. Even even in India, there isn't anything. So, I mean, this is something which our generation who has grown up in Pakistan or India have no idea what, what was it about. What is the story of those people? So let, let's take that second part of that question, first of all. the I would argue that the reason that the military history of the colonial period is relatively neglected in South Asia is precisely because it doesn't fit within the easy, comfortable stories about national becoming that are central to the ways in which uh, many people in South Asia, particularly those uh, in, in power, ha have sought to narrate that story. It's much more comfortable to uh, rehash that familiar story about um, about Gandhi, um, about Jinnah, uh, and about the heroes of the independence struggle uh, than it is to think about these soldiers who, in some senses, collaborated with the English, who, in some senses, helped to facilitate foreign domination, if that's what we think happened in this period. Um, so it's not surprising to me that, that we don't hear very much about the soldiers who fought on behalf of uh, the company. Um, I actually think those soldiers fought normally for pay, for the opportunities that service provided. They were really professional soldiers and the military labour market in India for a long time had uh, provided for considerable mobility. It was very ordinary, very normal for uh, soldiering men to move between employers, as it were. I think if we think about these men as, as labourers and their employers, uh, we get a much better sense of, of, of what was actually happening there than if we think about men fighting for nations and empires and countries. That's really a 20th century way of understanding what was happening. It wouldn't have made much sense to many of those people in the in the 18th and 19th centuries. On the question of um, recruiting and expertise, uh, I would argue that the importance of expertise about Indian culture, Indian communities, um, about particular religions, about what we might call ethnographies, um, comes in fact not from the centre, from the company or from the state initially. It actually develops uh, more locally. Uh, and I think we can see in retrospect that what happens is we get, first of all, officers writing about the distinctive experiences that they have serving with particular groups of troops and uh, embryonic forms of ethnographic or anthropological knowledge are produced, first of all, in quite ad hoc ways, in improvised local ways. And it's only laterally uh, from the 1880s that, that that process is systematised. It does become systematised. There are officers specially appointed to look after the recruiting of particular groups they are expected to acquire ethnographic expertise, mm -hmm. understanding the history and the culture of these groups, understanding where to find the best troops. Um, but that happens after the knowledge has begun to form at quite local, uh, independent, ad hoc levels. This is... Um, I still... I've worked with some of the army officers mm -hmm. in my other private job so you, you hear stories what you are saying right now actually you can still go there and see the remnants of those patrons in Indian Pakistani army so this must be something which is before I think 
the company arrived in subcontinent and and still somehow now through the influence of uh, 200 300 years of that uh, coordination and working over there still existed uh, and i mean <coughs> of course patans and from punjabi uh, from punjab area the people and uh, i would i would come back to the topic afterwards but i would like to mention this point here is that um to see someone as your own side and or or villain that happened uh, after in 80s when somehow pakistani army trained the afghan soldiers to fought, fight against the russian army and now it's exactly the opposite so now we miss the there's nothing no mention of uh, what happened at that time and you only hear from the soldiers that uh, this is so confusing for them because i think we are not trained to think in a way that uh, there's not always uh, two sides and there's not always either this is the hero and that's the villain so still they are very confused when they talk about it that how much um, they actually call it compassion that ha- they had for each other afghani army uh, sorry afghani soldiers or the fighters however you want to uh, categorize them and then the pakistani army and now they have to somehow go against each other so but continuing the uh, topic to partition so how um you are involved with the side of uh, actual partition from the date like around 1947 when actually or 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 maybe if someone doesn't know about that what happened around that time it would be good to actually just give up okay so i became interested in the history of partition because i wanted to follow through work that i'd done on recruiting in the 19th and early 20th century and i wanted to see what impact patterns of colonial recruiting and military service might have had on the violence that happened during the partition so um in the late summer and autumn of 1947 either side of the formal date of independence of india and pakistan on the 14th and 15th of august there was widespread systematic and incredibly destructive violence across punjab in particular um now we don't really know but somewhere around a million people uh, were killed in that violence and 12 14 15 million were displaced and i was interested in trying to understand how military recruiting and military service might have shaped perhaps contributed to that violence the province of punjab which was split between independent india and independent pakistan at that stage west pakistan was um really the heartland of colonial recruiting from the late 19th century and it seemed to me reasonable to postulate that there might be some connection between military service and the patterns of violence which occurred in 47 much of that violence was systematic it was well organized uh it targeted civilians it, it it was really what we would now recognize as a form of ethnic cleansing but it was perpetrated by individuals who had significant military expertise uh attacks happened in organized ways the attackers bore the clear hallmarks of military training and i was interested in trying to understand what role that military history might have in explaining the violence of partition so this is actually contrary to my understanding right now i'm sitting and uh, always i have assumed or maybe somehow i have been told by everyone that this is something very chaotic and this happened just because uh of a panic that uh, what if the other person who is from the other religion would first get me so i should actually go first and kill them to defend my family but hearing that it is very systematic uh, in in some way of course i mean there's no exact way of knowing where does it actually come from but 
I, I would really like to know a bit more regarding how, how do you place the players around this incident which happened? So the violence is often, has been, was certainly often talked about as kind of momentary, chaotic yeah. outburst of perhaps madness. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the ways in which people have talked about partition violence, they, they've often seen it as, as a kind of momentary insanity in which suddenly people lost control of their senses and perpetrated these unspeakably horrible and violent acts on neighbours and friends and uh, people that they lived uh, alongside for generations in some case. Uh, another way that people thought about it was, was to speak of a kind of outbreak of disease, a kind of communal fever that spread across Punjab and people lost control of themselves. People have compared it to, to natural disasters, a kind of an outbreak of a, a devastating fire that swept through the province or a flood which devastated uh, the region. Now, of course, there's something in some of these. They're evocative, rhetorical devices. Um, and it's certainly the case that the violence was often chaotic. Um, war is chaotic. Yes. Yeah? Um, but... To be pursued effectively, violence also requires uh, particular kinds of skills and knowledges and expertise. And when you look in more detail at the violence that happened during the partition, we see exactly the kinds of uh, expertise that we see uh, when we look at the history of, of war. Now, uh, there's a couple of, uh, of obvious examples here. Um, much of the violence in 47, much of the, the, the famous violence in 47 is centred around railways and the trains which took displaced peoples across the newly drawn border. Now, one of the very evocative famous images of partition is of the so-called ghost trains or corpse trains that um, arrived at Lahore and Amritsar, principally bearing the bodies of, of would-be refugees killed on their way across the new border. So these were special trains running on an irregular timetable. The train would be stopped at an ambush point. Uh, attackers would strafe the train with uh, rifle fire. They would go into the train and kill systematically uh, between carriage to carriage. They would loot the train and the people of their property and they would send them on their way dead stripped to arrive at Lahore and Amritsar and there are lots of very uh, striking contemporary accounts of uh, of these incidents. Now trains that are running on an irregular timetable are not stopped at specific ambush points by accident. Mm -hmm. There was a whole series of um, preparations made to, to commit those kinds of acts. They were calculated to send a message. They were a kind of performance, but they also provided opportunities for people to make material gain, uh, to acquire possessions and wealth. Um, that kind of violence isn't spontaneous or, or um, irrational. It, it has a, a logic and a purpose, and I think we can understand that purpose if we look in, in more detail at it. There are other examples too. One of the um, one of the other strategies used by attackers during partition violence was one that the Indian Army had spent a long time countering on the northwest frontier. Um, the large refugee caravans that that carried people or that that people uh, that 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 people um, formed to cross the border from uh, September of 1947. Now, some of these caravans would be 15 or 20 miles long. They're very uh, sparsely protected by, by troops. Um, what would happen is that attackers would uh, begin an attack against the column. They would generally um, fire into the column, try to encourage people to scatter and they would then, on foot, proceed into the column. They would kidnap 
uh, young women. They would kill. They would loot. Uh, the tactics used were very similar to those which uh, tribesmen had used against caravans in the frontier. So the initial attack would be designed to draw out the defenders. It would it would cause the civilians in the um, in the caravan to scatter and to panic, and they would then be much more difficult to defend. Um, and again, there's a clear logic to those kinds of actions. They're not the actions of people who've momentarily lost their mind. Um, they're planned, they're systematic, they show, um, they show the experience and the skill, in one sense, of, of the, the, the people who, who did that violence. Now, we lose sight of all of that if we think of partition violence as being just a moment of madness or being a, a tornado that swept across the, the, the Punjab. That, that wasn't what happened. So, so just to get the sense of what we are talking about, so you said that one million people, roughly, plus minus, within how many days we would say are killed? Well, the, the figures are, are disputed and it's very difficult to give uh, an, an accurate total and it's not something I've spent a great deal of time trying to do. Um, but the violence really escalates in 47 from March in 1947. There's violence in Ralpindi mm. uh, in the, the northwest of the province. Um, Ralpindi was one of the most heavily recruited areas. Uh, it's also in some ways quite a, a mixed area at that stage. There's quite a, a, a large Sikh population in Ralpindi at that stage. And the violence really begins in March of 1947. And it escalates again from July, August, and then August, September, and into October. It's pretty acute and it's chronic through most of um, the border areas. It, it begins first in systematic ways in the towns, in Lahore and in Amritsar, um, where there are large, easily identifiable groups of uh, so-called minority communities and those communities are effectively ghettoized and they're increasingly driven from the cities and then the violence seems to move into the countryside uh, along the border areas in the disputed districts and um, it's really uh, late September, October before that violence begins to subside and it begins to subside because most of the so-called minority communities have by that stage been displaced or they've been driven deep underground. Wow. I mean, so within six, seven months, this this is, this is, if you can understand your right as if something which is more organized, you wouldn't be able to just dismiss it because no one talks about this event as some big war. It's pretty much... Uh, rugged under the mats most of the time and uh, yes it is it is very much discussed in the families who have actually experienced it but in our uh, media um, in general films in mainstream media this is something not talked about in in this way and just to just to bring back there's the, what you talked about about the trains there's one story so my grandfather and my grandmother uh, was uh, living in UP, and uh, that's where their um, ancestral house is. But uh, my grandfather was in Delhi, and then he decided two days early uh, before 14th of August, they, they knew that this is happening, so he decided to go to Pakistan. And he is one of those people who actually left all his family, and just very few people came to Lahore. So he talks about this and that he's going into this train and this is one of the, those trains which were not heavily attacked, but it was attacked, but they didn't have rifles, but they had uh, swords or knives usually. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, they came in and they would slit the throats and they would kill no matter who, whoever, old, pregnant, young kids, ladies, and you would have to maybe save your life by putting someone else's blood 
on you and somehow hiding somewhere or playing dead. And that's how they came and to, to Lahore, to Pakistan. And, I, I, and this is on both sides. This is on both sides. There is no um, defending. There is no um, justification in whatever sense you can bring to the table. So to connect it more, I'm mean, going back, what what were the agencies who were training these people? How what, what is how does that where does it begin? I mean, I know you you talked about that it, it has a deep um, roots into the army recruitment, and because the the Punjab and Rawal Pindi that part was the hotbed for recruiting soldiers, so it could be a possibility. But how, what is the connection, and how does this particular uh, violence? How does they they would train for it, and who would assist it, and who's the leaders? Is there leaders? I mean, um, yeah, it's a it's a good question. It's a difficult question to answer um, directly because, in truth, we don't know enough to be able to unpick the most of the individual actions that we we know happened. Um, so I'll need to speak in, in broad terms. Please. I think by 46, 47, so after the Second World War, something like a third of the male population of Punjab has had military experience, has served in the Indian Army. And large numbers of those in the Second World War, some before that, um... So there is, if you like, a reservoir of military experience. At the same time, there are um, trained and organised bodies of men attached to many of the political parties. So the Muslim League, um, the Sikh Akalis uh, have a, a trained and, and an, an armed group. Um, and then in Punjab, we also have the princely states. So these are uh, often uh, relatively small, independent principalities which existed under the British Raj, uh, but as notionally independent uh, kingdoms or principalities. And many of those um, independent or notionally independent kingdoms maintained uh, military and security forces uh, and it looks uh, I think pretty it's pretty clear that, that some of those were involved in the violence uh, in pretty organised and, and systematic ways and then we also have people who we might think of as kind of violence entrepreneurs yeah. people who see the opportunities that um, ethnic or communal violence offers. Now, they might be politicians on the make. They might be, you know, gundas or badmashes or people who uh, with links to organised crime who see material uh, advantages in, in the, these kinds of uh, operations. And this all happens at a time when there are large stocks of uh, military... Uh, hardware, rifles, ammunition, machine guns, explosives, jeeps, uh, washing around North India. Um, you know, in the aftermath of the the Second World War, um, large numbers of American, large quantities of American military hardware washing around the North. There are lots of uh, the Indian Army uh, soldiers who who were defeated in the first Burma campaigns. You know, eventually made their way back, bringing sometimes rifles and provisions with them. And so you have large numbers of, of skilled men, relatively skilled military men. You have people with the um, with ad with reasons to mobilize those men. Uh, mm. And you have access to the technology which you need to, to perpetrate the violence. So 
it's a combustible situation. Yeah. yeah. I, d- I don't like the fire metaphor, but the the ingredients are there. And what we then find are that there are people who are prepared to put them together and to mix them in ways and to incite people um, in ways which uh, which produce that violence. Beautiful. I mean, this is what I love. Um, any, anytime I talk to someone who has deeply looked at a very particular, a simple part of our reality in whatever way, I mean, it's, it's either it's physical or cultural, it would sound that whatever an event is happening would be very complicated, but once you go into the deep observing of that particular aspect, you would realize certain basic aspects which kind of plays their part into, you know, bringing this complicated, combustible, as you've said, of course, this is an example, uh, into the form. So so I would say that... Um, I was thinking that where where else we have seen some something like that, and now it actually kind of makes sense, although of course it's very complicated, that there is some sort of a tribalism going on. Just our our oldest instinct, me against you. Somehow some people really believe in that, and they saw the opportunity. There is uh, some old military experience which could come in to use, and they might really think that they are doing it for for saving their people and then of course there might be the player which is in the middle just they they just want some sort of a benefit or power or they want some sort of a materialistic gain out of it or or then there are some people who are thinking that maybe they can actually mobilize this kind of approach and after this is over they actually get into political seats somewhere and maybe that might have happened and there might be some people who were big leaders and I don't know, like they must have played some role in... Uh... Yeah, there there, there, certainly were leaders. Um, I'm a bit sceptical about the idea that these are kind of primordial instincts uh, and that what happens is we take civilization away and and all of a sudden Mm. order breaks down and we get this kind of animalistic behavior i think there are a number of problems with that way of thinking about the violence um i I think there are some problems with the notion of tribe as well and i'll I'll try and say uh, 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 something about that in a moment the the violence i think is better explained as something which was planned and organized and coordinated i think if we if we start to think about this as being a kind of outbreak of our animal instincts, we really fall back into that trap of, mm. of naturalizing the violence. It doesn't look natural to me. Mm. Um, North India had had an incredibly diverse and a mixed population for generations. And now that hadn't always been a peaceful uh intermixture but that was true across many parts of the world that's not something that's particular to North India Um, and I'm not very persuaded by accounts which emphasize the kind of the the long-standing communal hatred uh, as an explanation I don't think they're very persuasive now just just quickly on tribes Uh, I think tribes as we understand them are ways of thinking about human groups which come out of the colonial period okay so and and we began to talk about tribes in the way that that term is commonly used at around about the same time that we began to think about martial races okay and i think that the whole discourse around tribalism was a way of constructing and denigrating ways of organising human societies. So tribe, even in its common usage today, conjures up ideas about Mm. primitiveness and Mm. backwardness, and it works in relation to an idea about so-called civilization. Yeah, Makes sense. Yeah, 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 definitely. No, not not that part of tribe. Uh, And I, I, I am not comfortable with that because just like the martial races served um, some colonial interests. Uh, So too, talking about tribes, 
served colonial interests. Um, so I think we need to try and step away from that language to understand what was happening. It absolutely is the case that there were individuals who sought to mobilise men at arms and who then sought to deploy them. We can, you know, we can see people doing that, sometimes wittingly, sometimes unwittingly. Um, Master Tara Singh, one of the leaders of the, the, the Sikh Akali movement uh, in the period, is in some ways, I think, a violent entrepreneur. Now, he may not always have realised what he was doing, what the consequence of the mobilisation he uh, enacted was, but, but we can certainly see that, um, that work that he does in inciting and mobilising and encouraging particular ways of thinking about... Um, uh, about the Sikh community and about their, their right to a territorial uh, homeland um, is important in the, the violence of partition. I, I can see the trap, what you just said, in our use of language of tribe. Mm. And, and this is exactly uh, what you just talked about, that yes, you, you can build ideas around that and again somehow uh, organize this and and you can fall into this trap of talking about tribalism and then connecting back to our um, tr old instincts of somehow which is uncontrollable and yeah there we, we have to I mean while I'm talking to you still I'm falling into that trap so this is this is very important to understand the subtleties between these things so your project um, regarding the partition what is the what is the you you mentioned that you are going to India um, next month? I mean, how, what is the update? How what is going on? Are you collaborating with someone? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to the National Archives in Delhi uh, for a couple of weeks later uh, next month, actually in June. Um, principally, I'll be working there, not in fact on the partition project, but on other work uh, looking. Uh, towards a book that I'm writing about the, the cultural history of the Indian Army in the late 19th and early 20th century. I have a couple of partition-related things to chase up while I'm there, but um, principally that work is going to be for the, for the book that I'm writing. The partition project that I'm involved with at the moment is... Uh, part of that work is a collaboration with a, a local company called Nootcook, who um, are... Uh, like a performing arts company and they um, they approached me last year through a mutual uh, friend, in fact a former Greenwich student and we um, have been working together for about six months now looking uh, towards a project on the oral history of partition and really trying to get partition into more conversations about British and South Asian histories. Mm -hmm. So these are histories which are very closely linked and tied together. And, you know, the partition was actually very important in shaping uh, the lives of many South Asians who subsequently migrated to Britain, both in uh, the late 1940s and the 50s, but then again after... Um, the Bangladesh War in 1971. So, you know, partition is a history that's tied up with the history of South Asians in Britain and particularly South Asians uh, around London in the southeast. So, the project uh, is collecting oral histories from uh, partition survivors, and we're using those histories to create. Uh, an art installation that will travel around various uh, melas and fairs. It'll come to the university here for a while in nineteen ninety and twenty nineteen, and um, yeah, I'm really excited by it. It's a it's kind of new Brilliant. departure for me, yeah. uh, doing things that are not uh, so academic and which <laughs> a bit more popular. So one of the things we're doing is we're developing an educational pack to go to go into schools to be used with primary school children which I'm quite excited about that's something I've never done before and as I now have two uh, primary school age children it's something that you know I think is really important to try and find ways of communicating this history and this work to kids uh, is something that I think is really important yeah I mean I wish 
that for historians, I think one of the best thing out of technology would might come is a time machine. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. <laughs> um, it's not something I'm working on, but I'm sure that there are clever people who are working on it. Yes, yes. I mean, what would be? I mean, I I guess I I don't want to guess, but I should ask this question to you. If if there is a chance, if you can go back, where can where would I go? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I suppose. Um, I would probably have to go back to eighteen fifty seven, um, and to the rebellion to 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 try and understand that a bit better. Oh, okay. Um, I would uh, I would I would like to see what see what happened then. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd I'd, I'd love to go uh, to what the British called the Northwest Frontier, and to to really see what that was like in the. Uh, 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. That would that would be tremendous. So so again, so, so that's what I think your book is about. What you are planning, if if you want to talk a little bit about the book. Uh. Yeah. So the book is um, well, it's been a long time in gestation, <laughs> but it um, it's really a cultural history of the army in the period after the rebellion. So it looks at how the military was reorganised after the rebellion. It, it, it deals in some detail with the shifting recruiting patterns that I talked about a little earlier on. And then it looks also at how the military was deployed. And it tries to do uh, quite a detailed and a careful cultural reading of how the army operated in the field. Um, we now have a series of histories which provide us good insights into the, the social and cultural history of the military. And to some extent, we have histories which, which help us to understand the military in South Asia. And I think what we don't have nearly enough of are detailed, careful understandings of how culture shaped what the army did in the field. And, and I would argue that that culture was just as important in shaping the ways in which armies fought as it was in shaping the ways in which armies were represented. And we don't know enough and we haven't uh, had enough good work so looking at the, the, how, how militaries fight in empire. So this is more towards North Waziristan? Or yeah, so I've done some work on, on Waziristan. Um, I've done some work on... Uh, the Black Mountains and the Hazara province. I've done some work on a series of other um, expeditions. And, and really my argument in most of those examples is that the very things that the army sought to do reflect some of the cultural ideas which the army had developed to explain its position in India, in South Asia. So, for example... The, um, the, the, the frontier expeditions of the late 19th century, and there's more or less an expedition every year, or troops engage more or less every year through the, the course of the late 19th century. Um, these operations were very, very difficult. Uh, they were difficult for a number of reasons. The topography, the geography, the climate... Um, they were difficult also because the the, the tribesmen, so called, against whom uh, colonial troops were invariably sent, very often refused to fight. They slipped away and fought what we would kind of now call uh, guerrilla campaigns. And and when you look at what the uh, colonial troops and their officers tried to do on the frontier, I think we can see the ways in which cultural assumptions about the tribesmen were at work in shaping what the military tried to do. So I can give you one quick example of that. One of the very common phrases used in uh, contemporary sources in, in writing about frontier conflicts was, was this idea of lifting the purda or lifting the veil. Mm. So it was said that sending colonial troops against these backward tribesmen was a way of lifting the veil or, or lifting the purda from the frontier tribes. Now, that's quite an evocative, quite a gendered way of thinking about what these operations did. Purda, of course, being the seclusion of, of women. 
Um, so really, this these were campaigns which were about trying to penetrate and disrupt the honour of the um, of the frontier populations, and they reflect those same ideas about quote unquote tribal groups, about quote unquote honour that we talked about earlier on. And when you follow that logic right down to what they try to do in the field, what they're trying to do is this kind of spectacular performance of power. Very often, they're unable to fight against tribesmen. So what they do is they blow up villages, they set fire to things, they confiscate uh, fodder and crops. The, 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 the wars, so-called, are actually, in many ways, these theatrical performances of colonial authority and I think there's an interesting cultural reading that can be done of that kind of work. So just to get the geographic uh, part right for someone who don't know Black Mountain where would it be situated at that time and who controlled it and what is the political uh, situation? So the Black Mountain is in what's now Pakistan and in, in Hazara province in, in the, the northeast. Um, it was at that stage more or less the most northerly point of colonial authority, most north, northeasterly point of colonial authority in um, Punjab, northwest frontier province, um, depending on the, the, the period. Um, it was notionally in British authority, though that authority was pretty untested around the frontier. And in fact, lines on maps are always a lot clearer than in, in reality uh, they are on the ground. Um, and in Hazara, on the, the so-called Black Mountain, there are a series of expeditions across the late 19th century. Um, the first major one in 1868, again in 1888, again in 1891. And the Hazara frontier really remains disturbed all the way uh, through until uh, independence in 1947. So when you said about the lifting of Parda, I actually read it differently for some reason. I, I read it in a way that lifting a veil from barbarian ways of life rather than just from the Parda, the veil, which women does. So w what is what is the uh, connection to that? It's both. No. You, so you're right. Uh, it, it, it means more than simply... Uh, you know, you know, breaking the purda uh, of the, the the seclusion of the um, the female members of the family. I, I would argue that the the metaphor obtains its power because it is a way of, if you like, emasculating uh, tribesmen mm -hmm. by performing authority by performing colonial authority in terms which the British think are legible or understandable for the tribesmen. Yeah? So they think that what they are doing is challenging the tribesmen's sense of honour, demonstrating their ability to um, reach them, to influence them and to, to denigrate them. This is, uh, again, I, I mean, I all, whenever I read Black Mountain, I just my mind goes to Black Hills, mm. which is from the, I think, the Native American Lakota tribe, mm. their war. And I think it's 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 funny, I just came in my mind. It is not that different, actually, that what uh, American army tried to do. I think this is this somehow the, the concept of uh, civilized and barbarian and ill-mannered, somehow justifying. It's so common, and it, this is fascinating. I mean... W I didn't knew at all that British also did expeditions with the Hazara and the, the Black Mountain tribes. I mean, this is something which is pretty much not even discussed in, in that part of the world. And this is even more sad now I realize that they have been ignored still, uh, still to this date. And this is pretty much the same uh, kind of setting which is now you see in Afghanistan. So this work which you are doing, Afghanistan and American war, eh, same descriptions. I mean, 100 years ago, they used somewhat similar techniques, mm. 
or 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 some what what is the what is the difference and how i mean this work is relating to what you are seeing now or seen last decade yeah i mean i i think there are lots of uh continuities it's, it's easy to overstate them we should be careful to try to uh, not to do that um but yes there are lots of continuities i i, I worked first on the black mountain expeditions in uh 2002 uh which was not long after 9/11 and while the uh the campaign in Afghanistan was going on and i was very struck at that stage by the parallels between contemporary accounts of 19th century war and what i was seeing and reading about uh the ongoing campaign at that stage in Afghanistan uh, one of the ways in which that parallel uh, appeared to me was in the role of technology so uh the afghan war and and latterly of course iraq we saw lots of footage on the news of so-called precision munitions of targeted strikes which really became these kind of ways of projecting the technological superiority the capacity of the uh american military and their ability to target apparently very carefully very precisely um particular groups of people and these operations it seemed to me had a very obvious spectacular or performative element yeah mm-hmm. they were almost calculated to be fodder for the nine o'clock news um and in many ways i think similar things can be seen in in 19th century conflict now the technologies were different but telegraphy uh was used as a way of linking and connecting different parts of the um the colonial front um mountain artillery were used as ways of targeting fairly distant villages across valleys um for kind of spectacular destruction and contemporaries who wrote about conflict uh, on the black mountain in in the 1880s and 1890s you know wrote about choosing villages for destruction precisely because they were far away you know so the technologies were different but actually what was happening was a very similar i think kind of spectacular performance of military authority um now it was experienced in very different ways by the people against whom it was directed okay so um and i think that's true in afghanistan and it's uh, was true in the 19th century as well but for the people producing that show mm. it seemed to me there were lots of parallels between what was happening in Afghanistan lately in Iraq uh, and what happened in the in the colonial wars of the 19th century that I've worked on so what is this i mean this is just your opinion if you if you are okay to talk about what is this drive we have which is very common we see it in many different uh, war states um we we see it in military powers that that demonstration which you have to do is it some somewhat our ambition which drives us and then we want to somehow solid so, uh, solidify it by actually testing it out with some other ways of living and then you know somehow announcing it to ourselves and others that this is a superior way i mean what what is this drive which it just happens all the time uh, rather than just being like okay this is just another way of living well uh, um i can talk with more uh authority i think about what happened in in india in the 19th century and most of these conflicts are conflicts about resources and about power and about influence so the hazara uh campaign of of 1888 begins when a survey party is attacked now survey parties um are about knowing and understanding the environment and they're about knowing and understanding the environment usually for um for economic or material reasons and uh 
um, although we don't exactly know what prompted the initial violence, uh, I think it's hard to disconnect the violence from the wider tension between an expanding colonial regime and the indigenous societies upon whom that expansion is is pressing. Um, and that's a pattern that we see broadly across the northwest frontier uh, across the late 19th century. These are often uh, about, uh, th these are often conflicts rooted in tensions over resources and, and influence. Um, and I, I suspect the same was mm. true in, uh, in, in the wars of the 20th and tw 21st centuries. So it's always about collecting stones, bananas. It's about something, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's about influence yeah. and power, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's a way of, uh, uh, yeah. So it's, it's about influence it's, and power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I mean, this is great that um, you're trying to portray and actually share this kind of historical knowledge, which is truly important. I can see uh, just just this talk and just reading about it that how we are somehow making the same mistake somehow. Even with all our technologies, I mean, we go through the same paths and we somehow learn pretty hard. Uh, and and I think that is very important what um, your projects are about, like the artistic oral histories. I mean, I think this is, this is a great idea. I, I can see that it could benefit a lot of uh, people or, or young generation kids or, or school kids or university who would, can grow up actually understand uh, and and learn from what I mean you are pretty much dedicating your life to something uh, which is very important I mean I, I can share a little story so this from um, um, a sci-fi uh, dystopian or u utopian future and the and this is about and that's when I realized that how important the knowledge of history is I mean, I always knew it, but there are those experiential, emotional moments. And it's, it's about a group which is going on a, some sort of an expedition. And uh, uh, there's a priest who dives and then uh, he, he don't know what happened in all of the ex expedition. It's a very important expedition. It would save the human race and, and all the other races. And then he wakes up. And he missed about a hundred years, and then, but he has a record of um, what happened on that particular expedition. So, and I'm reading that, and he's listening to what happened. And uh, in the middle, someone asks him a question, and he's this priest who has a great influence and knowledge, and he says that I cannot say anything. I cannot actually be of any use if I don't know what happened in last hundred years and he, and I listened to each and every sorry I was reading I, I read each and every thing which happened and how he interpreted and of course his level of intelligence how writer portrayed and how he come to the conclusions and how he used them as tools to then act in the present so that I mean knowledge and that kind of uh, interpretation and understanding of course as, as human race and and just even our individual um, capacities to act in this uh, society through the knowledge we are learning it is very important that we have a realistic and critical um, understanding of what is happening so I mean what, what do you what do you in your ways uh, in actually communicating somehow this kind of uh, knowledge have found the best way well I think for me what I'm trying to do what I what I hope the work that I and others are doing um, will do in the end is to encourage a more critical history of war and a more critical uh, popular understanding of what war was and, and what war is and, and how and why people fight and what the consequences of, of fighting and violence is. Um, you know, we, we live in a, in a country uh, and, and in a world, I suppose, where 
histories of war are massively misunderstood and romanticised. We have, I think, deeply problematic relationship with the histories of violence which have helped to make us as people and as, as a nation. And I think in the current environment, it's especially important that we equip people to have a sufficiently critical understanding of, of um, our common histories and of the role of violence within those histories. Um, I think lots. Uh, I think it's great that, that kids have learned a lot about the, the First World War and the Second World War, but I think a lot of what they've been taught about those wars is, is really, really problematic. And, you know, we have a comfortable, romanticised, whitewashed view of what the wars were about and of what they mean and of who was good and who was bad. And, you know, I think we need a much better, more critical understanding of the role of war and violence in the making of modern Britain. And I hope that the, the work that I'm doing uh, my academic work and, and the, the collaborations that I've been involved with will, will help in, in small ways to, to, to foster that more critical sense. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Is, is there anything else you want to share? No, I'd just say thank you for having me. And, uh, I've enjoyed our discussion. Maybe we can do it again at another time. I am looking forward. There's a lot of topics and there's, there's a lot of questions that I understand I'm, I'm aware of the time. So thanks a lot. Thank well, you so much. Well, it's been good. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.